Congratulations on deciding to start a business. By now you've probably defined your business, created a business plan, and developed a budget for your startup expenses. But now you have to find the money to fund your dream. I'm Megan Halsey, a business lender with Craft3, and I want to help you understand a little bit more about the options available to you in startup funding. The first thing you need to do is get an understanding of how much money you're going to need and know precisely what that money is for. Startup costs can vary widely based on the type of business you're going into. For example, a consultant may need little more than a website, a telephone, and a computer, and a suitable workspace to get started, whereas a company that's manufacturing a physical product is going to need significantly more. As you evaluate the startup expenses, it's always a good idea to understand what's a want and what's a need. In almost every situation, you can pare down your expenses. For example, if your dream is to make custom made-to-order gluten-free cakes, you may want to build a bakery with a customized commercial kitchen. However, your startup need may really be renting 25 hours per week in a shared commercial kitchen facility. Developing a complete understanding of your wants versus your needs is important because it's likely that you're, likely that you're going to face some trade-offs as you launch your business. Knowing what you're willing to forego until a later date will make that process much easier. Now that you've got your ideal budget and knowledge of a few areas you can shave down if needed, let's talk about the types of funds. The first option, and the one most entrepreneurs opt for, is self-funding. In the startup world, it's also called bootstrapping. Bootstrapping simply means the entrepreneur invests his or her own savings or capital into the business to get it started. Many entrepreneurs opt to run very lean in the early startup days and keep another job as they build up their business. The benefit of bootstrapping is that you're not taking on debt that you have to repay and you're retaining 100% ownership. The funds for bootstrapping can come from a lot of different places, from your regular income from your job, from your savings or investment accounts, from a part-time side hustle like driving for Uber or doing odd jobs, or from a retirement account. Entrepreneurs can use 401k, 403b, or IRA funds to launch a startup without a penalty by using rollovers as business startup or ROBS rules. Because these funds are highly regulated, it's important to work with a qualified tax advisor if you choose this option for financing your startup. If you're using retirement funds, it's also important to understand that the option comes with a lot of risk. You're putting your retirement at stake. You're going to have to comply with strict rules and criteria or risk significant tax penalties, and it's pretty expensive with substantial upfront fees. For some companies, self-funding makes perfect sense. You can grow your business slowly and organically and develop systems to respond to your customers and their needs as your reputation and client base grows. However, there are a few disadvantages to bootstrapping. Saving up the capital you need can be a slow process and may not let you take advantage of a changing market. Some companies need a significant injection of capital up front to get started, and saving that money through a regular job or a side hustle, it's just hard to do and takes a long time. If you choose to fund through bootstrapping, you also may have to go a significant period with a low salary or maybe even no salary at all. And finally, running too tight a budget in the early startup phase can cause you to use the wrong financial tools to finance the growth of a startup, like using credit cards or high interest debt that makes it really hard for you to get a loan later and maybe impossible for you to pay back. Bootstrapping isn't an option for you in your business. There are five kinds of outside financing you can consider. Debt financing, equity financing, grant funding, pre-sales, and gifts. So let's start with debt financing. Debt financing is a loan. It means you're borrowing money from an outside source and promising to pay it back with interest by a set date in the future. So why would you consider debt financing? Debt financing allows you to spread your expenses over a period of time, usually five to seven years, with a lower interest rate than a credit card, and it allows you to access the funds you need to start your business up front. Using debt financing means your ownership of the company, also called equity, is not diminished. You still own the whole company, but you'll be responsible for making payments on the loan even if the company doesn't perform as expected. So where can you go for a loan? The most common sources for debt financing are banks, 
credit unions, or CDFIs. There are also some online resources that can include peer-to-peer -peer loans, microloans, and there are always predatory loans. Let's start with banks. Banks don't often lend money to startups because they want to see that a company is established and generating revenue for a period of time, usually two years or more before they're willing to lend, lend to you. They're also going to insist on something substantial for collateral. Collateral is something you pledge as security, like a house or a car. It sometimes feels like a bank will only lend you money if you don't actually need it. But it's not because they're trying to deprive you of access to funding. It's because banks are tasked with protecting their depository accounts. Banks are highly regulated, and the amount of risk they can take on is limited by federal banking rules. So startup companies usually aren't a good fit. If you really want to use a bank, you may be able to access a home equity line of credit. That can provide a great option with lower interest rates than many of the other choices, but it may not be an option for everyone. If a bank isn't the right choice for you, you can also consider a loan from a credit union. Credit unions are a lot like banks, but they're member-based nonprofits and have a bit less regulation. All the profits they generate are invested back into the institution or paid out to members as dividends. This means lower rates on loans and a little more flexibility in loan structure and risk tolerance. However, like a bank, they're still going to protect the interests of their depositors, which means they're going to have some fairly traditional standards on collateral and may want some history of business operations. Another option you may not have heard of is Community Development Financial Institutions, or CDFIs. CDFIs are private financial institutions, typically nonprofits that are mission-driven organizations that provide loans to help low-income and historically disadvantaged people and communities access capital. Craft3, the company I work for, is a CDFI. Like most CDFIs, we have a limited regional footprint and we have specific types of businesses we prefer to fund. We invest in the success of our borrowers by providing referrals to resources designed to help them become better business owners, and we often maintain regular communication with our borrowers longer than a bank or a credit union might. Because we don't take deposits and we take on higher risk clients, the cost of funds with a CDFI loan are usually a little higher than a bank or a credit union, and CDFIs are designed to be a waypoint. Businesses start with the CDFI, then sometime in the next three to five years, graduate on to more traditional financing once they've built up a history of successful operations. CDFIs are the least regulated among the traditional business lenders and can be the most creative with the structure of the loan and what they'll consider as collateral and how much collateral we require. CDFIs can also work with borrowers who've had credit issues and are more likely to make a loan based on projections for a startup. Of the traditional sources, CDFIs are most likely to lend to a startup. Banks, credit unions, and CDFIs can all take advantage of SBA guaranteed loans for startups, which can be a great option for some borrowers. The SBA, the USDA, and the BIA all have guarantee programs, and guarantee programs can offer lower rates to borrowers. However, they do tend to have higher upfront fees and usually require cash in from the borrower first. Also, as with working with any government agency, there's typically more paperwork involved in getting one of those guaranteed loans. Sometimes people can get a loan from a friend or a family member. If you're going this route, it's important to determine what the terms of the loan are in advance and document it. Make sure you consider what the payment schedule looks like, how long the loan is going to be for, what that term is, and what your interest rate is going to be. In this case, it's not just your business that's riding on this loan, it's a relationship, so you want to make sure you protect it and enter these arrangements with caution. In recent years, we've seen a lot of online lending companies and websites emerge. Some of these offer traditional loans, there's a few that are offering peer-to-peer -peer loans, and some do offer legitimate loans. But be wary, many of the companies lurking behind those sites are actually predatory lenders. Predatory lending is any lending practice that imposes unfair or abusive loan terms on a borrower. It's also any practice that convinces a borrower to accept unfair terms through deceptive or unscrupulous actions for a loan that a borrower doesn't need, doesn't want, or can't afford. The bottom line is this. If it seems too good to be true, it probably is. There are some red flags to look for when evaluating an online lender. If the lender is reluctant to discuss financing details, including the interest rate, the term of the loan, or the fees for the loan, go elsewhere. If they don't evaluate your ability to, re to repay the loan by checking your credit, 
or asking for a debt schedule, keep looking. If the fees and interest rates are inflated, like higher than you might pay on a credit card, or if they insist on weekly or even daily payments, consider other options. Once you're in a predatory debt situation, it is very hard to extricate yourself and nearly impossible to get ahead and actually build your business. So avoid them at all costs. If you're uncertain whether a loan is a good option for you, or whether a particular loan is predatory or not, contact your regional small business development center and talk with an advisor. With nearly a thousand offices across the United States, there's one near you and their services are free and they can help you make the right choice about debt financing. Another option you may wanna consider is equity financing. Equity financing means someone is putting money or assets into the business in exchange for some percentage of ownership. Equity can take two forms, partnership or investment. In a partnership relationship, each owner has a financial stake in the business and can make decisions about the company. This works really well when the owners are in agreement, but can be problematic when co-owners disagree on strategy, especially if the partnership's 50-50. In a partnership, it's generally expected that each partner take an active role in the company in terms of strategic planning, administration, and or delivery of the product or services. In contrast, investors tend to put money in with an expectation of a significant return on their money, usually from a major business event like a merger, an acquisition by a larger company, but they don't take an active role in the day-to-day -day operations of the company. Investors typically look for fast-growing companies that have the ability to scale up operations to serve large markets. That rules out most small business operations like restaurants or coffee shops, at least in the early phase of operations. Investors typically are not involved in the regular operations, but may take a seat on the board of directors. If you sell off a significant part of your company, 51% or more, they can direct how your business operates and even remove you if you're not in agreement with how the company should be run. If you're considering raising money through investors, you'll need to consult an attorney or an advisor as investments like this are highly regulated by the Securities and Exchange Commission, and you need to know the rules before you start. You'll also need to prepare an investor pitch, which is usually a 10 to 15 minute presentation to persuade investors of the merits of your idea and the quality of the leadership team you've recruited. Investors come in several types, generally defined by the size of their investment. Please keep in mind the, the following are generalizations, and there are always exceptions. Investors come in several types, generally defined by the size of their investment. The smallest investors are found through equity crowdfunding. This is a new growing segment of investment. In equity crowdfunding, companies take to the web to promote early stage businesses to interested investors. Investors can purchase shares with as little as $250 in some cases. But with small investments, companies wind up with many owners, which can present some interesting challenges for a growing company. The next level of investors are local investor organization networks, or LIONS, and angel investors. These are typically groups of high net worth individuals or corporations that like to invest early in a company's life cycle, either independently or as a part of a group in amounts of less than a million dollars. Lion investors may invest in very small amounts, from $1,000 on up, whereas angel groups typically invest $25,000 or more. Lion and angel groups sometimes invest in companies that are pre-revenue. Pre-revenue means a company isn't making any money yet. They just have a prototype or an idea. Angels and lions are typically involved in pre-seed or seed rounds of less than $3 million. Venture capitalists, or VCs, are typically firms that raise large funds to invest in early stage, high growth companies. VCs usually want to see significant revenue generation before they invest. VCs will fund the growth of the companies hoping to see a large return on the investment. This kind of investment typically aligns best with innovative companies that can reach large audiences rapidly and usually have a technology component um, as a part of the sales or as part of their product, like Uber or Amazon. VCs are large players and typically look for companies raising $3 million or more. Unlike a loan, equity doesn't need to be repaid. The investors or partners are taking a risk on your company. If it doesn't perform, they're going to take a loss. However, if your company does perform, investors are going to be looking for a payoff, either through dividends and profits 
or by the sale or acquisition of the company by a third party. Another source of capital is grant funding. A grant's a cash award that doesn't require repayment, most often from the government, but sometimes through a corporation, foundation, or other business entity. Grants are most often awarded to companies pursuing an innovation or advancement in science, technology, healthcare, or education. While grant funding doesn't have to be repaid, most grants come with a lengthy application process, require regular reporting from the recipients, and are very, very competitive. Sometimes the reporting requirements for the grants will make it just not worth the effort or cost of gathering the data, so be sure you read the fine print before you apply. If you think your company may be a good fit for a grant, though, check at www.grants.gov. Pre-sales are yet another option for funding. Pre-sale is where you offer a product or a service before it's officially available. The most common form of pre-sale is crowdfunding. Sites like Kickstarter, Indiegogo, Fundable provide access to hundreds of people looking for the next big thing and allow you to utilize social media to promote your idea or product far and wide. Crowdfunding platforms vary in how they operate and what they charge, but in general, you need to declare a minimum acceptable fundraised amount and a timeline in which you expect to achieve that result. There are also costs associated with this format of fundraising as you'll need to create a video to support your campaign and create various reward levels and be prepared to package and ship those items. According to experts, it's also helpful to come in with a strong list of email contacts who will help you promote your product on social media as well. In some cases, you can also pre-sell your product to the community you're planning to serve. Sometimes pubs or coffee shops will offer membership groups like mug clubs where you prepay a set amount prior to their opening or in the early days of their opening and members of these clubs are entitled to a set discount on any future purchases. If you're considering pre-sales, especially through an online platform, be sure to research the options, your obligations, and the associated fees and historic success of businesses like yours on the platform. Finally, there are gifts. Gifts are just what they sound like. Funds that are given to you as a gift to start your business with no expectation of product, services, or repayment. The most common source of gifts are friends or family, but you may find there are people willing to support your idea and are willing to make small donations through web platforms like GoFundMe. This typically works best for small businesses that fit a niche in a community like a craft brewery or an ice cream shop. Now that you have a general understanding of what capital is available, the next step is determining which ones are fit for you and your business. That means you'll need to do some research on your own. There are many resources for the research, but they're going to vary depending on your community. But regardless of where you are, a great place to start is your local resources, including your county or your city, your local chamber of commerce, and your regional small business development center. And don't forget the local public library. Most libraries have a business librarian who can assist you in your research efforts, and they may have some links to some of the other resources such as the Lions or Angel groups in your area. Good luck on starting your new business!